Yeah. I was there and I direct the International Studies Institute here at UNM. And um, although not here, um, Christine Sauer, the associate director, is really the person who started this program and both the institute as a major. We are very proud of our um, large undergraduate major, over 200 students, and that's a major that started about three years ago. The lecture series is addressed uh, primarily to our um, undergraduate students, but of course to everyone else and the general public as well. I'd like to introduce the topic since I see some new faces here. During the last five years, we have witnessed unprecedented upheavals that have pitted the principles of democracy, multiculturalism, and respect for human dignity against often intransigent, intransigent uh, political and religious positions. Concurrently, the economic crisis affecting several countries within the European Union has caused increased unrest within and beyond the EU. Speakers will address the crisis of modernity from the local to the multinational levels, comparing developments around the world, and examining problems and proposed solutions. Modern societies in crisis, global challenges, and solutions, we believe will enhance the community's understanding of current political and economic upheavals and their effects on New Mexico and the Southwest. And um, with us, before uh, introducing um, today's uh, speaker, this evening's speaker, I want to thank, first of all, the community of speakers uh, within UNM and beyond who made this possible, who agreed to land, um, share their expertise and their energy and their beliefs in um, addressing problems, but also looking for solutions. With regards to um, moral and financial sponsorship, we're very thankful to the university, the Office of the Provost, the College of Arts and Sciences, as well as uh, University College, the Feminist Research Institute, the History Department, and the Peace Studies Program for supporting the lecture. And uh, we are um, also in, um, uh, we're also very grateful to the Colorado European Union Center of Excellence and the European Union, as well as the New Mexico Humanities Council and the uh, National Endowment for the Humanities for also supporting this project. So today the lineup is that uh, <laughs> uh, uh, my colleague and friend, uh, Claudia Isaac, uh, director of the Community and Regional Planning Program at the UNM will introduce the speaker David Heckel, and then Alex Lubin, who gave the Noons presentation today, the chairman of the American Studies Program uh, Department, will uh, be the commentator for David, and then there is time for discussion and some treats here, and here we go. It's my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, David Henkel, uh, both from the Community and Regional Planning Program at UNM. David Henkel has been an emeritus professor since 2010. He joined the Community and Regional Planning uh, community in 1985. His work has spanned borderlands kinds of questions between the US and Mexico, land management throughout the United States, in Europe, and in Latin America. He has his PhD in sociology of development with minors in city and regional planning and international agriculture from Cornell University. His BA and MA is in international, I'm sorry, South Asian regional studies from University of Pennsylvania. He has been the New Mexico Economic Development Division director uh, that was in the 70s, 80s? 80. 80s. Um, I've currently been privileged to work with him in, through his work with the American Friends Service Committee. He serves as recording clerk to the National uh, Board of Directors and is the clerk of the New Mexico AFSC com Committee. And that 
group has done a great deal of really important work on food sovereignty, food security, um, and other food-related issues. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce David Hengel. Thank you, Claudia. I think you're supposed to say cheese, right? <laughs> okay. Um, I want to begin, before I talk about this topic, by reading something to you <clears throat> from The White Roots of Peace, which is actually a book of the Iroquois Nation, the Haudenosaunee. The peacemaker came a long time ago, before the Europeans came. It happened at a time when there was a conflict among the Indian nations living here, from north of Lake Ontario and all through the Finger Lakes and the Mohawk River to the Niagara River. It was a civil war. There was already a prediction that something would happen, but when there was a time of great trouble, messenger would come from the place of our creator to help the people. Our peacemaker was born among the people north of Lake Ontario near the Bay of Quinte. He was Huron, and it is said his birth was attended by unusual circumstances which suggested spiritual powers were present. It is said his message of peace and good mind was sent from the one who created the human beings, our creator. When he was a young man, he began talking about bringing peace to all the nations, but his own people rejected his message. Then he journeyed among the Mohawk, and eventually he found people, leaders, who were willing to listen and to take hold of what he was trying to, to teach. Everywhere, people were abusing one another, ambushing innocent people on the trails in the forest, attacking people in fishing camps and even in the towns. It was said that women and children bore scars from these endless conflicts. Assassinations were common. Some of the worst of the warrior leaders were even sent to commit cannibalism upon their enemies, almost as if they were hunting humans for food. It was a very bad time. The peacemaker came to the Mohawk looking for some of the leaders, war chiefs, who were responsible for continuing this violence. He found some of those leaders, assassins, candles, sorry, and a lot of bad people at first, more willing to listen to his words and to become sane human beings who possessed healthy minds. There were nine of them among the Mohawk. When he was in Mohawk country, he summoned to the side, he was summoned to the side of an Onondaga chief who had abandoned society and had gone to live in the forest in self-imposed exile because his daughters had all been killed through assassinations and sorcery. His name was Ayawenta, and this is where the English name Hiawatha comes from, although the poem about Hiawatha has nothing to do with this story. Ayawenta became the peacemaker's loyal companion and assistant in promoting what would become the great law. The peacemaker then journeyed to the Oneida, and the same thing happened that had happened among the Mohawk. He found leaders and persuaded them that violence could be replaced with thinking, and they, like the Mohawk, said that if the other nations would take hold of this proposal, this law, that they would join. Eventually, there were nine Oneida leaders who followed him. When he came to the Onondaga, most of the leaders listened and agreed to his plan, but there was one who did not. His name was Tadadaho, and he was a very powerful and stubborn man. The peacemaker spent some time at Onondaga, but he made no progress with Tadadaho. After a time, he went among the Cayuga with his message of peace. And again, the leaders agreed to his plan. Then he went to the Seneca. And after a difficult time, the Seneca also joined the plan for the new order. The Seneca were the largest of the original five nations. And they had a great many warriors. Now, all of the five nations have embraced the plan for peace as a good mind on the earth, except for one Onondaga chief, Tadadapo. All efforts of persuasion fails. Finally, a woman called the peacemaker, and Aywenta went to her lodge. She was a powerful and respected woman among the people who live west of the Genesee, and her name, Jigon Sase. She was the first woman to embrace the message of peace and good tidings. And she is called the mother of nations, with the peace queen, because she had a plan to bring Tadadaho under the great peace. The peacemaker and his followers journeyed to Onondaga to find Tadadaho. They discovered him in a swamp a rough, dirty place. 
His appearance, they said, was very frightening. Snakes were woven in his hair, and his body appeared crooked and misshapen, and everything about him was unpleasant to behold. The expression on his face that the people know he was a, let the people know that he was unbearably cruel. The journey to approach Tabat Baho took a long time. The Cayuga had joined this crusade, and they were singing a song which was provided especially for this meeting. When he heard that song, Tadadaho felt at first threatened, but it was the song that turned him, and he melted when he heard that song. He agreed to listen to them. He had long been the worst human being in the world, so terrible that the people had said, the mind in that body is not the mind of a human being, and he was this, the last to reform. But they were able to comb the snakes from his hair, from his hair to transform his mind using songs and words to bring in health and peace. Jikon Sase had told him, told them to use songs and words to transform his mind, and that he would become the leader, like the facilitator of the Grand Council. That is the story of the remarkable leader of the Haudenosaunee, the Six Nations. His title has been handed down from generation to generation, like the title of Dalai Lama or Pope. The author says, I am Tadudaho today. When an individual who holds the title of Tadudaho passes away, another is raised up in his place, and the tradition goes on. The Onondaga Council selects Tadudaho, and it is a great responsibility. Tadudaho represents the mind which promotes peace and the welfare of all people. He must be kind to the people and express love for their welfare, and he must never hurt anybody. When I was small, actually I'm going to pause right there. I think that really says as much as I want to say from this, because um, my lecture tonight is not about a cogent argument with ironclad conclusions. Uh, it's rather to invite you to use your imagination, embracing something that um, is actually available to us and present, but something we've not learned to accept. So um, the titles, I say, may suggest something more linear. Um, and when I began to frame this presentation, I referred to a large number of programs, mostly undertaken by nonprofit and non-governmental organizations throughout the world, but also some corporations and some governments. And I came up with a, a large number of programs operating to transform the way in which people relate to one another, economically, socially, politically, and even in terms of the use of force. Um, I can give you a notion of what those are at the end, but I'm not going to read you a catalog of them because that doesn't require imagination, and although you might admire them. Um, rather, I would like to draw from their experience as a way of helping us to think about other ways that we can relate to the issues that, that uh, we face today. And one thing I'd like to begin with is by mentioning that our challenges exist at the community level and the national and international levels. But we cannot resolve them in one of those places or another. They must be addressed in all of those different levels. And they are the solutions to these issues that we face, which we'll talk about in a moment, that occur on these different levels must be addressed interactively. That is, what happens at the national level cannot be divorced from what happens locally. So I will subject you to, I guess, what is called death by PowerPoint. <laughs> so one of the issues that uh, occurred to me as I began thinking about this was that we have become the inheritors of a pattern of behavior. We've become habituated to uh, to deal with what we perceive as external threats in a forceful manner rather than a collaborative, constructive one. And I think it's important to note that not all conflict is bad. Conflict merely means disagreement. It can, however, take very bad forms. It can also be very creative. And so our challenge is to try to stress the creative to diffuse the harmful. When it is aggressive and when the intention of the conflict by one side or another is to have a zero-sum result, that is, one side captures all, the greatest dangers arise. And yet, many parties, including our own military and other militaries around the world, 
would prefer to resolve issues that they're called upon to deal with militarily, not militarily. In many cases, they would prefer uh, to deal with them in a nonviolent manner. And there are a lot of reasons why that is so. Um, I think that people who have been engaged in violent struggle are the ones who understand best the tragedy of that struggle. The rest may be observers of it and have feelings, but the stakes are very high for people who have been there who are responsible for that. So um, let's talk a little bit about what a common notion of danger and of security might be, because these are terms which um, surround us daily. Um, so first of all, it's probably important to distinguish between uh, actual dangers and perceived dangers. And perhaps the better question here is, what are the dangers we are told that we face? Dangers come in many forms, ranging from the international to the individual. And international threats include armed invasion, transboundary pollution, and economic collapse. They're big things. Those latter two also occur at the national level. Societal dangers comprise disintegration and collapse of basic human rights and means of cooperation. At the community and individual levels, dangers often have to do with basic human needs and social integration. Our reactions to perceived dangers is often stimulated by commanding voices in the political class. The greater reach of such voices, because of their position, makes their method more effective in reaching people, but also opens the way for effective propaganda that only partly reveals the truth. So we can hear many things, but the completeness of what we hear, the fullness of it, is not evident. So in determining what constitutes actual threats, as distinct from perceived threats, it's important to consider with whether all of the voices that might be affected by such dangers are actually being heard. Is this story being told us by many people, by a few, and what are the interests of those voices that are speaking to us? So, dangers. Um, messages about the scale and the nature of immigration, for example, are sometimes used to stir up political responses by worrying people rather than by posing solutions. We certainly have lived in a period the last several years where that is evidence, uh, evident in front of us. In recent years, the political voices have used these issues to scare the broader American public. And this sometimes constitutes a wedge issue to elicit support for totally different matters. Get people to the polls because they're excited and worried about something, and then the issues at the polls that uh, you're voting on are quite separate. So if uh, we can hold danger apart for just a moment, what about security? And this is a word uh, which also has different ways of resonating for us, and it has shifted in recent times. Uh, it's, uh, it comes from the Latin securitas, which comes from securus, meaning to uh, feel free from care. Um, and that's rather different sometimes than the security issues we're presented with. But um, it, in its movement or its um, co-optation, away from the more general descriptive sense of, uh, of freedom from care to an institutional one, um, it, it allows us to uh, project a notion of security that's quite different perhaps than at the institutional level, the broader level, than we feel and are affected by personally, or that our communities are affected by personally. So what is talked about at a national level of security, what's talked about at the community level of security is sometimes quite different. So if we look at these three different areas, um, it's clear that the purposes of security may be the same, which is freedom for care, but in terms of who is being freed from that care and how it works is quite different. I would like to just point out that at the national level, we talk about national security, we're talking about the perpetuation of the state. We're not talking about protection of you or me or our families. We're talking about the carrying forth and the protection of an institution that um, sometimes represents as well and sometimes not. 
So it's important to recognize that that, that kind of language is used to serve the, uh, the interests of the state itself. So if that's the case, these different kinds of higher level notions of security are intended to protect us from dangers. Here are a few. Um, we are worried about, most uh, recently, about Ebola spreading from Texas to New Mexico. Um, and we are, uh, and we are also, I think, concerned about um, the penetration of drugs until we begin to figure out the origin of the drug wars and a lot of that, which actually is not necessarily something which is generated from far away, but in fact very close to home. By which I mean the uh, stimulation of, uh, of the war on drugs and the drugs which are being warred upon is actually uh, a product um, of our own fulminations in Latin America as a means of destabilizing those societies. But we project it as though it's coming from there independently. So given this notion of danger and security, let's think about what we're scared of and how, how fear works among us. The threats come in various shapes and uh, forms, but um, the key variables include changes in relative security, perceived threats, and responses to those perceived threats. And of the threats, there are several kinds. This is a handful. Most of us are familiar with these. Um, there are others which uh, we think of as sort of natural disasters. Um, we should note that a lot of natural disasters are disasters because of the conditions under which they occur, which have a lot to do with the way humans um, are marginalized, for example, and made vulnerable uh, in their communities and not protected from landslides and floods and fires and a bunch of other things. That if, in fact, there was a more equal distribution of resources in society, more people would be protected from it. So we think about a large number of landslides occurring in Costa Rica or Colombia. Those landslides would not occur if, in fact, people were able to afford to build in places and in manners that, uh, were, that are available to people with more resources. So all of these uh, kinds of um, threats are real to us to different degrees. Psychological threats may be experienced at the local level, but also by mass society. And that's also true of economic and political threats. So when we think about threats, then we project um, how big they might be. Um, everybody has some sense of vulnerability. But if we look at the nation state level here, um, this slide on the left there refers to issues or areas of, this, of the United States where we still are thinking that we might be subject to first strikes by thermonuclear weapons. On the other hand, if we look at uh, East Asia, we are concerned about the vulnerability that to our interests, largely military interests and our allies, posed presumably by North Korea. Now, you have to decide to what degree these threats are real, but these are issues that people portray as vulnerabilities for us. Russia's got one too. They feel surrounded, and when we th begin to consider the Ukraine, uh, Crimea, uh, it's easy to vilify Putin, and maybe that's worthy, a worthy thing to do. But it's also true that in Russian history, there's a feeling, there's a sense of having been invaded and having been vulnerable and in danger with, uh, with uh, as long as the uh, surrounding areas um, have not been neutralized. So. Russia has an interest, strategic interest, in maintaining a non-Western presence on its borders. And China. This map is actually is a version of a map that I first saw, I think about 1968, when people were concerned very much about China's role in Vietnam, which is a historic illusion, but um, people were worried about that. The Chinese map showed all these American bases and, and weapons surrounding the Chinese. So we're all actually suffering from the same kind of sense of, of, of vulnerability, of danger. Um, are these mutually exclusive? They should be. Are they? Well, why aren't they? Why is it that we are unable to recognize 
the sameness of the sense of danger and vulnerability uh, that we feel is existing elsewhere. So in response to these kinds of senses of fear, we, um, we can either try to kill the messenger, destroy the, uh, the opponent. We can neutralize the threat without engaging in destructive action. We can flee from the threat if we can get away, or we can succumb to the threat. And the, uh, I think the assumption is often that if we don't flee or fight, that somehow we'll succumb. And I'm just going to suggest that those are not the only options in front of us. But the way in which we do that is by projecting power. Uh, that is, we try to preempt other nations, I mean, we're still talking at the nation state level here, from messing with us by having a presence that would, um, that would be so fearsome that people wouldn't dare. And so, one slide, this is one that actually Alex used this morning, I was very pleased to see it, on the upper left is uh, the instance of US military presence, both bases and alliances and so forth um, around the world. That's how we demonstrate our power to preclude people from attacking us. Um, if you look at the bottom slide there, these are Russian relations around the world. Um, and so they too have a series of uh, presences which they hope will deter people from messing with them. And this, uh, this upper right hand slide here actually has to do with conflicts uh, that have occurred in Asia between different powers and the size of the circles is the number of conflicts that that particular uh, state has been engaged in. Uh, so uh, behind China with 61 come the Philippines with 24 and Japan with 19. These are uh, things which have occurred from the 1950s through about 2010. So um, this is the notion of projecting power. Power does not only have to be projected militarily. In fact, China tends to project power economically. Um, and that actually, in the current days, since our own economic dominance has eroded, makes us very nervous. So finally then, what do we do? Do we eliminate the threat? And what does that mean to eliminate the threat? Well, partly it means taking away the immediate danger, but in the long run, it also means avoiding repercussions from our actions. So you can eliminate the threat, as was done in World War, um, between, uh, well, in World War I, and then you can leave a mess behind which creates World War II. You can plant seeds because of revenge and a sense of resurgent power of those who you have defeated, or you can reconcile. And this is something that has been done um, creatively, not at the big power level so much as at lesser powers. So we'll talk about that in just a moment. So just dynamically, if you think about this as a, a kind of a system, you have essentially a, de a dependent variable which is the social behavior in a society. And the independent variable is the sense of relative security. So the uh, notion here is that the greater the sense of relative security, the uh, more stable the social behavior. And more stable social behavior sort of reinforces the, uh, the notion of relative security. But when you introduce the notion of threats, um, you stimulate a different kind of response. Instead of having a mutually reinforcing one, um, you make people nervous. And um, I guess it's been said that uh, fearful people do stupid things. But one of the things that we tend to do is to react against the threat but as we do that, we also destabilize our sense of security. And so as we look at the potentials for intervention here in a different way than physical force and armed aggression, it is these areas that we need to, we need to transform. So this is the full, the full set of what we've just been through here. I'd like to change um, frame of reference. The foregoing leads us to ask several questions, and these are some of them. Uh, maybe one of the uh, questions is also, is dissent patriotic? Um, but the first question is, is violence, violent conflict inevitable? 
I think we are hardwired for conflict, but as I said earlier, conflict isn't necessarily bad. But are we hardwired for violent conflict? I don't think we are. Um, I think we've learned to, to engage in behavior, but I think we can learn other behaviors. And so those other questions um, ask us if we are prepared or can, see, can conceive of doing so. The last question also raises the issue about whether we are dependent upon somebody else to do this for us. That is, can we as individuals or as members of communities take action without being blessed by the, uh, the larger political structures? And my sense is we have to. So what are the alternative ends here we're pursuing? We can preempt the threat. That is, we can, and deterrence, I suppose, is one kind of it. Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to prevent a threat from being carried out. But you can neutralize the threat. And interestingly enough, this is um, a part, a very strong part of martial arts training is not to destroy your opponent, but to neutralize the threat. We can learn a lot from that. We can also resolve a situation without leaving behind pieces that invite retaliation and revenge. This is something we have not learned very well in recent years. We have, in, we have engaged in revenge cycles that we're not even aware of. This is clearly true in the Middle East, but it's true in many, many other places. And we can reconcile, we can reintegrate all parties to a conflict. So what should we do? Well, I would suggest that we've spent a lot of time dealing at the nation state level with limited success. We need to bring into that picture is the community level as well. Because these are the people who are affected most directly by the things we've been talking about. And they represent all of us who are not necessarily confined to historic patterns. We can think out of the box where institutions have a harder time thinking out of the box. We can look for common interests between us even when we disagree. And we can avoid um, squatting on top of historic positions, which presumably have evolved to represent our interests, but often don't. We can um, engage with conflicts in more constructive ways. But we can't really do any of that if our goal is not also social justice. That is, there's no peace without that kind of justice, because people are always left out. You can't afford to leave people out. And the other is, which is a little more mechanical, something we possibly should have done following um, September 11, 2001, is engage in policing rather than war making. But let's consider that um, in, in shifting from the nation state level, who are we talking about? We're actually complexes of diversity. So the, if you look at the language groups, pictured in the left-hand side, um, across the United States, you have concentrations of people who emigrated here from different parts of the world. And if you look at the right-hand side, you look essentially at clutches of culture which come out of those those settlement patterns. Um, it may be presented in a humorous way with only the United States of America seeming to exist in North Carolina there. But in effect, uh -huh. what we're saying is that cultures are recreated in different spaces. And as they do that, they, they conflate with other cultures, but they also are engaged in dynamics with those cultures. So somebody looking at the United States, having come to New York, oh, I've been to, I've been to New York, I've been to the United States. Well, any of those who've been to the capital city of anywhere only has never been to that country, really. You've been to a, a postage stamp version of it. So then how do we take this knowledge of our own complexity and think about it in terms of other people's complexity? Because in the end, it's not all of the United States as a monolithic structure that we're talking about. We're talking about the individual communities that compose it. So in Russia, you have historically and at current times vast numbers of language and ethnic groups settled in different places with their own dynamics with the other people who live in those places. So you look at New Mexico as a great example of that. We have layers, almost geologic layers over time, of people who have been here and then other people who've come and a lot of tussles between them and then they sort that out and the next wave comes and more tussles. And so 
our current stage of immigration is yet another version just of that. It's not the end of the world, it's just a, another wave happening and we need to think about it in those terms rather than in uh, stark uh, binary terms of us and them. China has even longer history of all of this and they have a tremendous challenge in trying to maintain, I, I, I'm of many minds about this particular point, but China has an incredible challenge in trying to deal with a country with so many people of such diverse origins and maintaining some kind of unitary structure to provide um, a, a, a polity, an economic base, uh, a, um, a sense of public safety and security, um, actually through uh, the organs of, of one particular party, which itself is narrow, but does not present all these interests. So when we think about recent um, issues between, say, the Uyghurs and, uh, in the western parts of China and their connection and their sense of identity and worldview, those are things which are not part of our daily point of reference, but they are similar to the conflicts that we even have here. So we have to re recognize that the world is a very messy place, a lot of different people, a lot of different languages, and we need to appreciate that kind of difference. Let's take something that's a little bit more historic that we're dealing with here. So we have a large number of ethnicities in the so-called Middle East, which actually is part of Africa, and part of Eurasia, and so forth. And then you have language groups, dozens of those on top of that, spoken multiply within the ethnicities. And you have these countries that they are in, but the countries have changed um, in important ways as a result of international conflict. So what was that same part of the world in 1914 got rearranged as a result of World War I, and got rearranged by colonial powers who ultimately failed in uh, maintaining control, although uh, they were, certainly had a very strong influence in controlling resources. And then from, in, from the um, the mandates, the colonial exercises at the end of World War I, after World War II, they sort of reshaped themselves into these nation states, all of which are trying to find an identity. And to, for us to insist as a country that Iraq needs to get its act together, well, Europe created Iraq from something that wasn't. And the people who are in conflict in Iraq were deployed differently before that happened. And so we are actually living in a time a very tiny sliver of historical time where we can't figure out why people can't make sense of this. And it's because we created uh, a mess, essentially. And we're trying to, uh, we're trying to uh, fashion it into a world, um, into, into our own worldview. If you look at Kurdistan, you, know, you can go way back to, uh, well, before, but certainly to uh, Xenophon, the Greek historian, and the Anabasis talking about how the Kurds punished the Greek armies who were actually just trying to, to decimate Persia. They weren't really after the Kurds. <laughs> but in the meantime, uh, the Kurds have had their sense of not unity, but distinct ethnicity in a region that's persisted through all of these changes. Um, our, world, our, our policies directed toward these parts of the world are very simplistic. So let's think about some of the key issues and some of the responses. I put on one side these hot buttons. There are a bunch of others, but I'm not going to talk in depth in each of these. But there are also different ways of thinking about how to resolve, and the, um, the buttons on either side are not necessarily correspondent. So if you look at, say, at water. Now, water is, a, is an absolute necessity. Um, I have to catch up with my notes here for a second. So, um, and policymakers are increasingly concerned about the regional side effects of water shortages in the future. There's a lot of um, hand wringing about um, they're going to run out of water and they're all going to kill each other. And if we're not careful, it'll affect us. Well, that's not necessarily true. Uh, but it's a way of, of becoming sort of um, nervous in anticipation. Um, there have been other ways of dealing with water conflicts. Um, and yes, there there are different kinds of water demands and there are different water resources. But for example, if you look at Southeast Asia, you look at the Mekong Del uh, Basin, you have um, 
But you have China, Myanmar, Burma, Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia, all of whom depend on uh, the Mekong for different kinds of things. Uh, historically for agricultural irrigation purposes, but increasingly now for hydroelectric power. So you have a lower Mekong initiative, which, which attempts on the basis of uh, compacts between the, uh, the nations uh, to manage this resource in the interests of all those populations. Now, if you look at that map on the right-hand side, you look at the, uh, the existing um, or con under construction or proposed dams, um, you have to understand that those are intended to provide hydroelectricity to um, places which are not local to, the, to the, the basin itself, but they're intended to stimulate economic growth in uh, farther reaches in the uh, resident countries. The money largely comes from north, it comes from China. And so the uh, uh, ability to actually construct and manage this kind of a resource is dependent upon funding to some degree. But the local people at the community level protest that, uh, that they do not get any benefit from it and that the intermittent flow that occurs as a result of such dams impounding water and then releasing it and impounding and releasing it um, creates uh, great dangers to irrigation works and also does not allow for the delivery of water in a timely fashion uh, for crop irrigation. So there's a distinct difference between the discussions that are occurring at the national levels and the ones that are occurring at the, at the local community levels. And um, some international programs have attempted to mobilize uh, or support the mobilization of local people so that they in fact can uh, participate in that national level discussion. And this tension between the national level and the community level is something which we see in this country about a lot of issues, actually we see it all over the world. And so the, the, um, the scale issues are, are profound. But there is a structure for uh, managing this resource without engaging in zero-sum conflict. A slightly different situation uh, in three river systems here, the Tigris and the Euphrates, so the far right these are small, so I apologize, you can't see them all. But the Tigris and the Euphrates, of course, um, provided waters for the cradle of civilization uh, and the development of agriculture, at least in the historic ways we know it. And the headwaters of both of these river systems are in Turkey. And Turkey has, mm, has its hand on the tap, but has managed to work with downstream users pretty much um, so that the conflicts are not um, explosive. But on the other hand, the Turks also want to use hydroelectric power from large-scale um, projects on both of these river systems to benefit other parts of Turkey which are not in the region. So in this sense, the scale isn't just the state and the community, it's also the geographic location. Um, nonetheless, the, there is a kind of homeostasis between the way the country is using um, these waters uh, as waters. It gets all involved in international conflicts for other reasons, but um, these systems are not being used to hold people hostage per se. Issues around the Jordan River are a little different. Um, the, the ability of Israel to control not only the River Jordan, but also the water basins associated with it are, are an instrument of control of Palestinian populations in the West Bank. And so, uh, Israel practices, uh, for political reasons, um, a degree of control over access to water for some populations that they find troublesome. Now that could just be, lead us all to thinking glum thoughts, but th what I find interesting here is that because that's a political decision, there could be a different political decision. It does not mean that the resource is not available. It means that there are choices that are made uh, through uh, rational streams of one sort or another um, that would permit um, more equitable access. Food. A lot more people. Um, maybe a lot of uh, eroding capacity to grow food. We've uh, lost a lot of uh, arable land through um, drought and through erosion. 
And there have been responses to this. I mean, again, we could say food is a zero-sum relationship. People absolutely need it. But we've had intensified cropping. Uh, we've integrated crops and livestock systems, which are more efficient operating together rather than uh, monocultures. The Green Revolution, for all of its um, disastrous effects, did produce a series of um, hybridized um, germplasms for commodities, rice, corn, potatoes, that enable the distribution, the growth and distribution of foodstuffs more efficiently in terms of production from smaller space. There are other sides of that, of course, the dependency upon petrochemically based fertilizers and a bunch of other things create serious problems with the stability of the soils. But we have the ability to make a change technologically. It isn't a solution, but it is an element. We also have another element, which I find more difficult to talk about, but in the interest of, uh, of frankness, then you have your, gen your genetically modified uh, organisms, uh, GM, GM foods, Franken foods. So all of you who are inclined to eat Franken foods, well, you can feel very hopeful about the future. Um, having said that, the point is that we can actually, we, we are currently capable of producing more food than we actually need to consume. We do not have the means to distribute it, nor are the markets um, receptive to an equitable distribution of food. But the production of food is not really the issue right now. Here's another one. Um, oil and natural gas, <clears throat> coal, biggie. Coal's a biggie. If you look at the bar charts on, on the upper left, those tall purple guys is coal. Now, so that means that uh, there's a lot of coal for some places, and the question is, do you really want to use it? And it's not that you don't want to generate electricity, it's that in the generation of electricity from some of these fossil fuels, we're creating unlivable circumstances globally in terms of the environment. So that uh, climate change is uh, partly a result of some of that. There are other resources. We can, they're expensive right now, but if we were to put our, um, our intentions uh, behind our dollars, et cetera, the world could look rather different. However, at the current time, we have issues with the access to and control of fossil fuels, and we're still locked into that frame of reference. And as long as we stay there, we're going to invite uh, great tensions. So if you look at the South China Sea, you have six, and some would also add Japan, um, countries who have claims on territory here. And I'm not going to get into um, uh, discussing um, which they are, but they all, uh, except for that the China has claimed more, well beyond the 200 mile uh, exclusive economic zone that is established by the law of the sea. And so it's got everybody else all in a, uh, in a twist uh, about how they're going to react to that. And uh, it's interesting that the politics of this, China would or like to be able to negotiate access on a one by one basis with each country. And the Southeast Asian nations, members of ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, um, are not unified, but they are very resistant to the one-on-one -on -one because they recognize there's no leverage of Laos dealing with China. But if they all got together, maybe they could have a multi multilateral conclusion. Well, we'll see. But in the meantime, you have projections of power. And this is, again, what we're talking about uh, down below. You have the presence of uh, people are strutting around saying, you know, we're serious folks here, and we got a lot of uh, military heft. So let's get moving on sol uh, solutions. So my point here is that you have a collectivity. You have a regional association. It isn't very strong. But the ASEAN nations are in a position to uh, negotiate with China collectively. And if they do that collectively, it would look rather different than an outcome where it's one to one. Climate change. And here's something which um, is necessarily uh, transboundary. Um, and the collaborative management of transboundary environmental impacts is a, is a key issue. But also, as part of that, is the need to reduce carbon-based emissions. That is, OK, we saw Kyoto, and then that didn't quite hold together. We're coming up into Paris. We're hoping something's going to happen. Basically, what has to happen is that the means of, of energy used for the production of economic goods has to shift in order for us to survive. 
least according to the science that we know now. And so both carbon emissions and the overall carbon footprint has to change. Here's a question for you. The Prius model of uh, automobile uses a lot less uh, gasoline than many of the other more conventional kinds. In pure carbon terms, what does it cost to construct one Prius automobile? So you may get to the place where what you're using is more efficient, but the getting there, the production of that technology itself has carbon implications. So the discussion about this is actually very simplistic. And it's because it, the thought of trying to connect all the pieces is overwhelming to most of us. But uh, I would like to point out that uh, the Germans uh, pioneered um, uh, legal requirements for technologies and other kinds of uh, complicated, durable goods to be built um, so that they could be, in fact, recycled. It is a requirement uh, that German manufactured technological products can be recycled. If we began thinking in life cycle terms rather than in short term benefit terms, our way of approaching these issues it would shift you know, dramatically. So let's come back to immigration here for a second. I want to point out a couple of things here. One is that uh, if you look at the United States, there's that dark green. It's like, oh, we have all these people coming in here. You look at Spain and Italy, oh, they got a lot of people coming in there. And they're coming from Africa. The people coming here are coming from Latin America and the Caribbean for the most part. And, and yet these are not really new pictures. They, they, respond to, um, they respond to the lack of basic infrastructure and basic human needs satisfaction in the sending countries. So we have an interest in the long run in the success of those countries. Not to control them, not to own them, but for them to be able to succeed. And most of our interventions in countries like that historically in the last 100 years have not been to help them get ahead, it's to help us get ahead. Um, but we package it um, as though it's for that. So as we go through this, if you look at the inflows, consider this. Um, we have uh, this, this picture in the upper left here is um, the historic origin of immigrants from 1970 to 1990. And um, a big chunk of those folks come from Asia, and a few from Africa, but mostly from Latin America and the Caribbean. What I find to be more interesting is that there's a, there's a continued connection between the immigrant communities who settle here and the places they come from. So they are in a position to, and they do, provide uh, repatriation of monies that they earn here to help the communities that they came from. And if we had what I consider to be a more rational immigration policy, those people would be able to go back home and enjoy visiting with their folks. And it would be a much more uh, lucid way of dealing with transboundary migration. It wouldn't just, people don't all want to live in America. People would much prefer to live among their own people if they can. And there are a couple of elements to that which we need to respond to. One is their economic opportunity, the basic, also basic needs, education, health, housing, things like that, and also public safety. But the public safety element is, is a complex of issues which come partly in response to economics, but also partly to our own US engagement in Latin America. So that in many ways, our past policies, um, which, uh, which have really been driven by an economic um, motive, have destabilized the local economies that then generate people coming north. And we don't have that full conversation in public. If we had the full conversation in public, we might come to different conclusions. We also forget that in addition to the actual numbers of people and our worry about what that might mean, there is a tremendous cost in people actually coming, coming here. And it's a cost going to Italy and a cost going to Spain that that we are thinking, we need to be thinking planetarily rather than nationally. If you look at, um, this is true in Asia, in Southeast Asia, with the Chinese having moved there, there are all kinds of um, resistances. Um, that the um, contributions by very hardworking and entrepreneurially gifted Chinese as they come to Southeast Asia have made. They make people very nervous because of their uh, because of their success, there have been um, historically reactions and mass reactions against the Chinese. Um, 
And it's also true not just against the Chinese, but against other internally displaced people. So that when we think about migration, it's not just transnational migration, it's also internal migration. And in the case of Indonesia, for example, a program of transmigrasi or transmigration promoted since the Dutch time in the 30s and carried on in the 60s and since then by the Indonesian government to try to get people to move from the most crowded island, which is Java, to these less crowded islands, which already had people living there doing things. And so the, the tensions then get built. Uh, there's a kind of narrow view that if you just diffuse the density, you're going to increase the capacity of people elsewhere. And in fact, you're bumping into other people who've already figured out how to live in that place, and there is no free ride here. So more people, but dense, where we, where we locate our people. So anyway, this is the one that I'd like to finish with in terms of these issues. The numbers refer to a Hoover index. The Hoover index posits um, the number zero as perfect uh, equality. And the number 100 is perfect inequality. And so when you look at, say, the US here, which is 43.2%, it means that we would have to redistribute 43.2% of our economy in order to achieve equilibrium, some kind of equality in our, uh, in our system. And so you see that Slovenia and Slovak Republic and the Czechs and Sweden and Ukraine um, are the more equal uh, income uh, societies in the world and that uh, a, a clutch of Central American, South American, and African countries are at the other end. But we're pretty much in the middle. I mean, when you compare 43.2 to 56.1, there's not that much of a difference. It's a lot closer than it is down to the 23.1, 25.5. So in many ways, we are a very unequal society. Well, is, it, is this bad, good, otherwise? It means that that there is not an equal distribution of opportunity for people. And so their ability and their interest in supporting a dominant system where they are marginalized is lessened. So now let's come to the term that we started off with that I didn't talk about at the front end. So what is shared security? Well, shared security is not collective security. So this is not uh, NATO. Um, shared security emphasizes mutuality and mutual interests and mutual solutions. Collective security emphasizes greater power and greater leverage through alliances. Um, and what shared security is directed at is a healthy society rather than a dominance. Um, Alex, uh, in his talk at noontime, um, pointed out that, um, that there has been an adoption of uh, uh, of uh, social control techniques from other parts of the world now applied in the United States. Um, you look at the militarization of our police forces, not just in Ferguson, but also in Albuquerque and other places. There is uh, a similarity in the training mechanism um, and the, uh, the logic uh, of counterinsurgency being employed as a policing technique in the United States. If we are talking about counterinsurgency, who are the who are the insurgents? Are we the insurgents? Is that why we have a police? Who are, who is who is being held in place by the Albuquerque police, by the Ferguson police? Why is this different? I mean, this is drawn directly from other parts of the world, and we're learning from it and paying for it. And so, is this to help our society become better, become more healthy? What do we mean by community health anyway? So shared security means that we would deploy peaceful means. And at the international level, this means preventive diplomacy, mediation, conflict resolution, and policing rather than war making. It means that we, con we conceive of ourselves as an organic part of a larger organism. That there is a element where we have to be invested in the commonality of our interests, not in the individuality of our interests. That we must promote resilient natural systems. Resilience is a sense really, really of health, 
the ability of an organism to recover from threat, from attack, whether it is a physical organism like me being sick, covering, or a forest, or a landscape. So the resilience of our natural systems are key. Instead of zero sum, again, regional cooperation. And also thinking about the after, not just about the now. As we resolve conflicts, are, is everybody brought on board? Is everybody interested in the outcome? That is, do they have an interest in that outcome? But at home, <clears throat> there are other things that are a little bit closer to us. And these are not minor issues. These are not easy things to do. But if we don't dismantle racism, if we do not um, embrace the diversity that we have among us, we are walking away from perhaps our greatest resource. Justice, again, preceding peace. Yeah. Income, how do we get to a greater quality of income and opportunity? How do we get to better environmental health, environmental justice? Well, one way is by devoting resources which are currently devoted toward um, a militarized society and a militarized way of doing things. If you look at the national budget, about half, and by some accounts, significantly more than half of our budget goes toward military um, equipage and manpower. And a fraction of that could be used to repair our infrastructure and to provide um, a more equal um, basis for people's mobility. And then community health. I asked a minute ago, what's community health? Well, it's all of these things. It's um, physical, it's the environment, it's infrastructure, it's um, many things. But in the end, it comes down to having a comity in our society, social justice, uh, that leads to peace and safety and advocacy on behalf of everybody, not just a few. And then this. Um, you probably know that uh, we have on a per capita basis, the highest rate of incarceration in the world by orders of magnitude, not just a little bit. And some of this comes because people have been smoking pot and they're put in jail and all that stuff and that's sort of being dealt with in some ways. But a lot of it is because our system is punitive. Our, our, we have a criminal justice system, we don't have a justice system. And we also have an, we also have an industrial element which has an interest in having full prisons. We have, uh, an economic element which um, um, benefits from uh, solitary confinement and from maximum security prisons. This is corrosive of our, of our communities. It's not just expensive, which it is, but it destroys families and it destroys communities. So I'd like to just acknowledge a couple of things here. Uh, one is that um, the issues that we're talking about, the concerns of this lecture series, um, may be referring to the last five or ten years that we are living. But the issues go way back. And so the reason of reading to you from the White Moose of Peace is here we're talking about the 17th and 18th century Haudassane people who were coping with similar things and came up with, at the community level, uh, ways of dealing with uh, these issues which lifted up everybody. Um, and it was hard work but it led to uh, a frame of reference which in fact found its way into our own constitution. Um, and some, would have ar some have argued also frameworks for the United Nations. Um, shared security is also a document. My, Claudia mentioned my association with the American Friends Service Committee. is a working paper that was produced last year by them and another Quaker body, the Friends Committee of National Legislation. So that you can imagine the Quakers have an interest in peace issues, and that's true. But this is an attempt to try to deal with some of the actualities of it. Interestingly enough, I was part of the discussion group that uh, framed some of this. Um, some of the other people who climbed on board supporting this notion have also included people who were assistant former se or former assistant secretaries of defense under the Reagan administration, things like that. People saying, what we've been doing doesn't work. We need to find something else. And so some of the ingredients of they're in here, things I've mentioned tonight, the last thing is this central, um, this central document. Um, Stefan Chenoweth uh, published this paper uh, 
uh, through MIT publication in 2008, and subsequently have, have written a book um, based upon this. They reviewed 323 cases of civil resistance, both violent and nonviolent, from 1900 until 206. And what they were after was trying to figure out what is the, what's the level of successful outcome according to violent and nonviolent struggles. And maybe my numbers are, I mean, I don't, we're not uh, channeling this properly, but very close. I think they said that 53% of the, uh, the successful outcomes were from nonviolent struggle, 26% were from violent struggle, and the rest were not successful. So what you have is um, the beginning of an analysis of uh, not just the ends, but the means. That is, um, if war is not the answer, what is the answer? And the answer, it seems to me, is a different way of conducting ourselves resolving conflict. Interestingly enough, and they went into case studies in this particular article, uh, looking at the Philippines, um, the end of the, of the Marcos dictatorship in the late 80s, um, East Timor, Timor-Leste, um, in, the, in the late, um, nine, well, the mid-1990s, and um, uh, Burma actually, um, in, before it renamed itself Myanmar, and uh, picked apart the kinds of, of movements um, and looked at the kinds of techniques that were used. And these were not all broad-scale Gandhian approaches. They were not all Martin Luther King approaches. They were a variety of approaches. There are lots of indigenous ways of dealing with these issues which don't come out of one model. Um, and we need to learn from these different uh, experiments the successful ones, and also learn from the unsuccessful ones, um, the path forward. The path forward for us is not going to come from somewhere else, nor is success somewhere else going to come from us. And it's important to recognize that. But we can learn from each other in terms of our determination to use uh, instruments which are restorative rather than coercive. And then just by way of, um, um, this is to let this sit with you for a moment. Um, this is a result of a very quick review of a number of um, um, nonviolent responses to very difficult situations which have occurred uh, within the last uh, 10 years. Um, one of the things that we need to remember is that the identity of other people needs to be articulated by them. Their stories need to be told by them. We have a tendency to represent uh, other people's uh, identities and their interests. And usually that's through the lens of our own. So what we really need to do is to back off from trying to characterize other people's situations and let them tell us, tell us what they believe their situations are. And I'll end with this last little piece. Um, the Democratic uh, People's Republic of Korea, North Korea, uh, big bugaboo for us as a nation in recent years, um, is depicted usually as a, um, a kind of proto-fascist regime, goose-stepping troops, um, starving people, a grim socialist, essentially a grim communist uh, party um, um, instruments that frame all public activity. And to some degree, those realities are there. But there are other realities there as well. And um, this is not to, to lift up a particular group, but because I know the situation well. The American Defense Service Committee's program is in Korea that works in agriculture. And one of the things that's happened, I want to just say a couple of things about this. The agricultural program helps the Koreans grow more food. And initially, the commands from the, uh, the party were that collective farms were supposed to raise X number of tons of food of various kinds. Um, and most of those projected targets were articulated by people who were not farmers, picked by, by bureaucrats and so forth. And a number of the things that they articulated couldn't be grown, and couldn't be grown in those quantities. And so part of the issue is that people on the ground are stuck because they're being told to do something that they cannot do. And they cannot uh, independently consult with other people to help them suggest an alternative. So, our program there has helped um, 
them develop different kinds of strains and different kinds of growing media so that they can, in fact, produce more food. Now, the important point isn't that, frankly, because the agricultural project is a means to an end. What it really has done is it built a trust from the, the uh, North Korean government authorities in this outside organization. That is, they're very suspicious of the motives of almost anybody coming from the outside. But this has been very transparent um, an operation for about the last 10 years. And it, it has invited more and more participation so that the, the Koreans then became interested in market economies. And they wanted to have, um, they wanted to have instruction in how to, cons cons how to arrange a, an agricultural market economy that was more responsive to their needs, but was also not just centrally controlled. Interestingly enough, the Chinese exper experience following Deng Xiaoping's loosening up of party capitalism provided an avenue. So that through these kinds of relationships, two things have happened. One is there's been more interest in learning from the outside, not just by the local communities, but now we're talking about government ministries asking these questions. The second thing is it's allowed local people to talk to, which was previously forbidden, people from the outside. So some of the, our staff people who come from China, some who come from here, are able to connect with those folks. Now, at a, o over a short period of time, that may not seem like very much. But over a long period of time, and get it, guys, we're in this thing for the long haul. I mean, our lives plus. Um, we have to make that kind of, we have to be willing to make that kind of investment in, in opening up different, different narratives. Because the Korean narrative of militarism is only one of them. And there are others that we don't hear. And for us to respond, to the dynamic of US versus North Korea in a constructive way, we have to have more information. We have to have more engagement. And it has to be of a different kind than each side representing the other, because the North Koreans represent the US for their purpose the same way we represent them for ours. So anyway, shared security, thank you. Thank you, David, for um, a provocative uh, talk. And I just want to summarize a few points that I found most salient, and then, I'll, then we can open it up for discussion, because I'm sure there are a lot of questions. Um, it seems like what is central, or one of the central aspects of the talk, is the way in which cultures of fear or ecologies of fear drive human conflicts, obviously. The perception of being uh, being uh, imperiled in some way or being vulnerable. And I think one of the things that, that David asked is what, to what extent can, this, can vulnerability not be a defensive position, but also be a means to forming collectivities. Um, and that reminds me of a point that I think Judith Butler makes about precarious life, the sense in which precarity can be the grounds around which we find commonalities or vulnerabilities and not just a sort of defensive posture of uh, fear. And he also points out that some fears are manufactured, some fears are very real, and you know, I, think, I think that's absolutely true, and I would, I would point out that also some fears are rooted in very real asymmetrical powers, and others are uh, manufactured, often by strong powers, when there really aren't uh, real material threats. Um, I think another really provocative point here is what is meant by security. And I heard um, national security, right, different scales of security. And I think David wants us to think about human security, or which is embedded in the concept of community health. And so what does it mean to think about human security or security in fundamental different ways? Just as an aside, in addition to the national security and international security, I was interested in thinking about uh, you know, topic that I spoke about, the US war on terror, where homeland security, right? What is the unit of the homeland, right? The homeland is not the nation anymore, or the, it's like something else. Um, uh, I think David also asks us to look at problems from different vantage points or different scales, not just through a sort of community lens, but sometimes through a national one, sometimes through an international one, in the hopes that there is a certain sense of common destiny or uh, shared vulnerability that can come 
out of that. Um, and then, you know, the talk got fairly radical, which I was, I was happy to see, which is uh, eliminate incarceration. All right, and no prison state. Um, and civil resistance. Uh, and I think an important point that I would just echo is the extent to which stories of vulnerability must always come from indigenous sources, and that people have to tell us the ways in which they feel vulnerable, and we don't impose on them uh, what, what we think is, is vulnerable. So I guess, I guess the sort of take home for me was the extent to which we might think about vulnerability and human security um, as means to reconstitute a kind of critical internationalism or critical communities, you know, whether the scale is the nation or, or locally, that um, through which we can solve certain human needs or we can respond to certain human needs um, in ways that are rooted in justice um, and in ending inequalities. So, you know, I found it a productive talk in those kinds of ways. So I will have a seat and we can turn it over to, to others. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> Yes, sir. Um, I sense a, a lot of hope in your voice um, that we can surmount some of these things. But uh, I'm very, uh, you know, and as a, as a species, I think we we uh, hope that we can do the right thing. But I'm really quite pessimistic that we actually will do the right thing on climate change. Um, I, I, I think the the forces there are so great that uh, I think we're going to wait till we have the shocks and then we'll, we're, we're going to be more reactionary. But anyway, that's my comment. I, I'm not very hopeful that that humanity will do the right thing there. Yeah, I, I understand what, you know, that, the nature of that comment. And I think that um, historically we have responded to emergencies when they are in our lap. And what we don't understand right now is it's in our lap. We think it's still out there. Um, maybe a few more years, maybe a few more degrees, but you know, it's not here, here now. Well, actually, it is here now because we've built up to such a degree that the inertia is carrying us forward. But I see, I think that, um, that I had a conversation with a close friend of mine from Chimayo who said, everything's going to hell in a handbasket. What the hell, what do we do? And I said, well, it occurs to me that if we look at these issues, um, at a very broad scale, there's not much that the individual can do to affect that. But at the community level, we can. And so my takeaway from some of this stuff is, are these civil resistance movements? That the, um, and I, it would take a kind of, of bravery as well as a kind of focus for us to engage appropriately. But the stakes here are enormous. And it's, it occurs to me that, um, that we are beginning to see uh, gatherings where people were talking about the march in Washington and, and so forth and so on, and marches all over the place just uh, last month. Um, and I guess the question is, can this be stimulated into something that's not the Occupy movement, which is less, which is more diffuse, but which has a specific purpose? Um, we are in a struggle with the structural economy that we live in, um, and we can either accept that because it's easy to, or we can resist it. But that takes individual change. It doesn't work just by some kind of legislative action. It takes individuals willing to change the way in which we behave and live. So I, there's an answer, but it's not an easy one. Right, no, it's right. Yes? Um, I definitely share the sentiment of that comment and follow up on what you were responding to that. I found it really interesting when you said, when you asked, do we require permission from the state to take action? And on an individual level, I've seen that play out with climate change and acts of nonviolence disobedience and I believe that that's commensurate with the, the threat that we face and uh, in proportion to the level of inaction that we're seeing from our government. But I'm interested in how like, communities and societies can um, take action without permission from the state. Um, well, in, uh, me, me too, but I think we do have some evidence, interestingly. Um, so let's stick to New Mexico where we can think about that. Um, I think the Mora County Commission, the decision to uh, pass an ordinance or, uh, curtailing um, hydraulic fracturing was not just the brainchild of three county commissioners, 
nor yesterday was it just the vote of the two, who, including one who decided that he would vote to maintain it as opposed to uh, modify it or remove it. Um, it was a lot of other people in Mora who are not um, university-based activists, but people who are land-based people and who see the connection um, between the effects of um, penetration of the Earth's crust and the distortion of their, of their water systems. So I think that when you were talking to people who have a very direct interest in a very fragile and vulnerable resource, they will respond. So I think that the degree of, of danger or immediacy needs to be part of that. I also know that sidewise now, um, this comes from some research I was just doing and writing on, um, our acequia systems, which are also fragile, um, provide a means for small farming. So scale of farming and food production is very important. If we're merely talking about uh, groundwater withdrawals um, from the Oglala Aquifer to uh, produce large uh, single crops of corn and so forth east side of the state or major withdrawals from the lower part of the Rio Grande down in Doniana County to produce pecans and chilies, that's one thing. But if you're talking about small farms, they're more to the control of people. There's a more direct relationship. And um, interestingly, both uh, the, the community of Chimayo, which straddles Rio Riba and Santa Fe counties, um, recently went through a planning exercise that was um, really conducted from uh, the county planning unit in Santa Fe, but with cooperation from Rio Riva. And the, uh, the element in there that was interesting was that uh, the land use guidelines um, recognize the right of uh, Aseke associations to prohibit the transfer of water rights out of, uh, out of agricultural use to, for some other use. And this is if the Aseki associations have, in fact, passed um, bylaws in their, in their uh, corporate um, structure, which enable them to do it. Not all have them are very small, but some uh, have done so vigorously. And so what I find interesting here is that you have Aseki associations in Chimayo collaborating with land use planning unit at the county level, where they are mutually reinforcing. And uh, so there are ways in which we can harness cooperation uh, from um, unincorporated civic groups, if you will, although the Secus associations have uh, legal standing as local units of government, uh, and local level, smaller level governmental um, bodies which are able to pass uh, um, legal uh, instruments, uh, ordinances, which protect that at that local level. Now, the question is, okay, so that's a great example. Is this um, what the, you know, the anthropologist reduced bongo bongo theory? It happened in bongo bongo, therefore it's true kind of thing. Um, how, 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 how do you spread this? And that's where it takes, I think, um, a connection um, of other civic groups, like the New Mexico Secu Association, to take that example and to present it to other places so that, in fact, there's a, a groundswell, there's a building of capacity through example of people who are recognizable the folks you're talking to. If I were to go talk to the folks in, in uh, upper parts of Rio Riva and say, hey guys, they say, you know, you're a huevo, you're, you're not even a paciente, you know, you're a nice person, but you're not convincing me. But if it's other paciantes and uh, other members of the Seque Associations talking to people, that's a different kind of business. So I think that there's more there than we've actually dug deep into. Well, I'm so glad you're all speeches. Oh, good. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, I was uh, struck by the uh, map of China that actually held, uh, had Taiwan countered in also. Yeah. And that's one way to uh, have Taiwan perceive a threat. Yes, right. <laughs> yes, and, uh, and I think the uh, news seems to be perceived very differently or, uh, or uh, told very differently in different places because before leaving China, I just come over. Um, I haven't really heard much about the Hong Kong riots or the protests. And suddenly it's the biggest news. Uh, so the fact there is, is just some disturbance and it's under control. You know, but, but I guess, uh, uh, I guess the, uh, 
what, what you said about uh, you know, uh, outside intervention, collaboration with project, and so forth. It has, uh, to some extent, uh, changed China because now they're more open. So there's probably less of a chance of the Tiananmen happening in Hong Kong. So they're kind of uh, uh, doing by uh, world and arbitration, uh, something to that effect, where uh, they're just waiting uh, to see uh, how long they can last rather than uh, creating violence. Yes, right. So I think that's, that's an improvement. So if there's, I, I, heard, I heard some pessimism earlier, but I think that's probably one uh, small spark of optimism. Yeah, I think that part of the issue is the time scale you're looking at. I mean, I think America, we have a very low tolerance for waiting. We would like, culturally, we would like things to happen right away. And if not, why not? Um, but other cultures can help us with a more creative sense of time. And also silence, by the way. Sometimes Americans are, I think, culturally inclined to, to inject every silence with speech, make noise of some sort. Where sometimes a much more effective, um, a much more effective strategy is silence and waiting. And we often misinterpret the waiting as giving up. So your comment, I think, is very important. That um, it's a spark. It may not be uh, the solution, but it's an indication of possibility. I think if we lose if we lose respect for uh, what's possible, then we're in danger. Claudia. With that comment, if there's a theme that seems to, to resonate through your talk, that it keeps coming back to the idea of little struggle, little success, and articulation of those little struggles and little success. And I think that the pessimism that I am susceptible to is we're living in pretty long times. But that's in part because the opportunity for civil resistance at the very local level seems daunting. And yet it's not. It's, we're told that it's daunting. Um, but we also see, I mean, to use the Aseki example again, one of the reasons I think that the South Valley Aseki Association was able to mobilize not just Aseki across the Memphis, but throughout the South Valley to get a delay on the Santo Lino de development um, because of the water drain that that would have on, on the Aseki's. The Mora example was motivating for the South Valley Asequia Association that, in fact, there was a little struggle and a little success. Well, it wasn't so little, but in, in terms of global things, yes, it was a little struggle and a little success, but it motivated and inspired other struggle elsewhere. And I think that's a really important, it's an important counter to pessimism. Yeah, it's the ecological principle. We're all connected, but these, are, these issues are connected and the responses are connected. And so then we begin to appreciate the greater, the greater strength of, that, uh, of, uh, of the movement to, to resist that, to transform it. Because it isn't just one, 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 it's all of them. Yeah. Um, I will say thank you. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you.